said he was being real nice for fear of he wasn't sure who was going to introduce him tonight. But I'm not going to pick on him. I've already taken that out on the other Daniel. We're very glad to have you here. We're grateful Brother Daniel Denham can be here. He was born in Pensacola, Florida. He's a graduate of the Bellevue Preacher Training School under Brother William Klein. He's married to Barbara K. Stancliffe. They have three children, Sean, Trevor, and Megan. The Stancliffs are with us tonight, and we're glad for them to be here, and Megan is here also. They also have two grandchildren. Brother Denham has served in local, in, as a local evangelist of Florida, Tennessee, Texas, and now Virginia. And he currently serves as the evangelist of the Newport News Church of Christ, Virginia. He's been located there for the past four years. And he is an instructor with us in Truth Bible Institute, which means he has to get the course finished with Jack. That's the only thing I can say right now, not put you on the spot. <laughs> He's done mission work along with his wife in Taiwan, and that was some years ago. He's authored numerous articles, rather than papers. He's written a book just on the Internet. I promise you, <laughs> several books. <laughs> <He's>, <laughs> he <laughs> writes for the Defender and Contending for the Faith when I can get an article out of him. Spoken on a number of lectures. Been preaching for 32 years, served as instructor in Greek, and I want to stop and say this. I hope I don't embarrass him, but I think he's one of the finest learning persons of the Greek that I know of nowadays, and uh, appreciate that so much. He has taught, of course, various Bible courses and did that in Bellevue Preach Training School, and he is, as I say, he says it. He, you have to. You signed it. You know, you named it. Your instructor in Greek. How far along are you on that? I think he's got the beta in the alphabet. Anyway, we're pretty sure. <laughs> he's got, maybe, is it just awful? <laughs> he's going to be speaking to us on sound doctrine and unity. Now, I know all of these are important, but wholesome teaching, sound doctrine, and the oneness of the church is just, how would you say it? Where it's all like some people say, at. Come speak to us. Brother David needs to be a little bit careful in dealing with Daniel Cole. He is part of the prestigious law firm, Daniel, 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 and Denny. <laughs> And that's Daniel Dunham, Daniel Douglas, Daniel Coe, and Denny Durga. And our treasurer is Ken Chumley, and he hasn't paid us yet. <laughs> so, <laughs> we'll feed him fish and chips. I appreciate the opportunity, and uh, I will get to work on that <laughs> as quickly as I on the Greek. Uh, I appreciate the invitation, the opportunity to be with you in this great program. Love this congregation, the eldership. Brother David Brown is a just a wonderful gospel preacher, great gospel preacher, and who uh, solid for the faith. And I love and appreciate his stand and amen him and uh, am willing to stand with him on any platform in opposition to error. He is a man of his word, and these elders are men of their word. And uh, the men that are on this program and who are typical of this program are individuals who will stand up and tell you what the book says, why the book says it, and they're willing to back it up. And uh, that's the way it should be. Concerning the lesson this evening uh, relative to sound doctrine and unity, I believe it's appropriate that uh, the two lessons were tied together. Uh, of course, Brother Whitlock was not able to speak, present his, but Brother Michael Hatcher did an excellent job dealing with the subject of uh, versions. You know, the, the version issue centers on a, really comes down to this, a respect for the very nature of the inspiration of the Bible. 
In 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 10, Paul tells us that the Word of God is revealed by the mind of the Holy Spirit. The Spirit revealed it. And in verse 13, it was revealed not in words which man's wisdom teaches, but words that the Holy Spirit teacheth, comparing spiritual things, those great wonderful thoughts of God, that uh, he intended for man. You know, the, Michael talked about the translations that emphasize the thoughts. Well, how do you understand someone's thoughts without their words? There are only two ways of interpersonal communication, either by the deeds or by words. Now, if somebody walks up and punches you in the mouth, you can pretty much get the idea that there are, you can get a message. But otherwise, you're going to have to resort to words. And it is in words that the Word of God was revealed. It is verbal, plenary, that is fully, inspired of God. And uh, Brother Hatcher did a great job with that. The Bible was revealed uh, through words that the Holy Spirit uh, speaketh, comparing spiritual things with spiritual in the implied substantive words. And so we have the very Word of God. Now, in looking at the subject that's before us, the psalmist said in Psalm 133, verse 1, Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. Unity is a beautiful thing. It's a wonderful thing. That is the right kind of unity. Unity is a precious thing in God's eyes. It's a thing that bears his approval. And it's something that God's people ought to desire and cherish. This is clearly an implication of what David has set forth here in Psalm 133. The Bible doctrine of Christian fellowship, which is founded on the doctrine of unity, is a subject, however, that is grossly misunderstood and in some cases perverted by even members of the body of Christ. And we need to be aware of that. The, uh, we have various uh, false doctrines being taught, and I don't have time to go into each of these. I deal with them in the manuscript. But we uh, have the big F, little f, fellowship of Ruba Shelley. We have the catcher side doctrine that uh, Brother Skip Francis dealt with earlier today. We have the five uh, levels of fellowship of Lagarde Smith, which is sort of a variation of those two. And then there's the uh, A to Z fellowship that, in effect, when you follow the argumentation there, you can just fellowship the Pope if you want to. Just as long as you're not doing it directly, let somebody else go speak with him and speak, uh, speak on a program with him. But you can appear with whoever spoke with him, and you're not guilty of sin. But that's just nonsense. Or, as uh, Brother Hatcher said, hogwash. They reject the idea of limitations on fellowship, and that's really what each of these doctrines is designed to do. Whether uh, directly or ultimately, that is the end result of these teachings. We need to understand <coughs> that God did place limits on fellowship, and that unity is not always desirable. Underline it. Unity, that is absolute unity among the people of God, is not always desirable, given all factors. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Notice what the Apostle Paul has to say. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 18, he says, First, he says, For first of all, when you come together in the church and in the assembly, I hear that there be divisions or schisms among you, and I partly believe it. Now watch verse 19. For there must, there must, there's a necessity, there must be also heresies or schisms among you. Why? That, to the end that, they which are approved may be manifest among you. Given all the factors of the case, the fact we're dealing with free moral agents, there are going to be times when some are going to choose to do evil. And in those situations, it is impossible to have unity in an absolute, complete sense among God's people with God's approval. Impossible to do. Go back to 1 Kings chapter 12. Think about the situation regarding the United Kingdom. Solomon had gone into sin. He had adopted many of the uh, religions of the uh, 
the false religions of the wives, the many wives he had married. He had set up high places to their gods, and he had apostatized from the truth. It is possible that in the closing year or so of his life that it is uh, then that Ecclesiastes is written, that he realizes and has come back. I pray that that be the case. But, <laughs> be that as it may, he has gone into sin, at least to a point that God has determined it's time to rend the kingdom out of his hand in some fashion. Solomon is in sin. He is about to die, and we have two men that come upon the scene following his death. In fact, one shortly before, by the name of Rehoboam, who had been a servant, and uh, Rehob uh, or uh, Jeroboam, the son of Nebath, who had been a servant. And uh, Jeroboam was selected to lead ten tribes, the northern tribes. There would be the southern tribe of Judah that would be kept as a light to the house of David. And that would be for Rehoboam and the Davidic line through him. You also have in the background of 1 Kings chapter 12, the conflict that existed between Ephraim and, and Judah as far as their rivalry with one another. They were both economic powers, religiously important in the history of the nation. Also, uh, militarily, they had uh, had some importance in the history. But when, but when you look at all of the factors, you look at the rivalry between Ephraim and you look at the rivalry with Judah. You look at the sins of, of Solomon. You look at the foolishness of Rehoboam. You look at the cunning, the guile of Jeroboam and the influence that all of these had in the dividing of the United Kingdom into the northern and southern kingdom. The end result, however, was ultimately of God. Listen, look at what 1 Kings chapter 12 has to say concerning this matter. 1 Kings chapter 12. Verse 24, Thus saith the Lord, Rehoboam has gathered the army to go up and he's going to force the ten tribes to return to the house of David. Thus saith the Lord, Ye shall not go up, nor fight against your brethren the children of Israel. Return every man to his house. Now watch the next statement. For this thing is from me. What thing? The dividing of the kingdom. Why did God divide the kingdom? Simply for this. Brother Rex Turner said this many years ago, and it stuck with me even to this day. He said, Brethren, there is strength in unity for evil just as much as there is strength in unity for good. And God divided the kingdom because he knew that was the only way to preserve the righteous and godly line of David to such an extent that the Messiah could come to save the world. Now, brethren, there comes a time when complete unity is an impossibility. And really, really, realistically speaking, you really never have complete unity because there are always someone who's going to go off into sin and apostatize from the truth. And uh, you cannot, if you know that situation, you cannot fellowship. And so unity is severed at that point. But that does not keep us from pursuing unity. And pursuing unity uh, with as many of those that are in, that are in fellowship with God. Uh, in fact, all of those that are in fellowship with God. Well, what about the definition of fellowship? Looking at this particular subject, we need to take into consideration really the definition of fellowship and also the definition of doctrine itself. The word fellowship, koinonia, is used some 20 times in the Greek Testament. Twelve times it's translated fellowship, four times as communion, once distribution, once contribution, once communication, and once uh, as a, uh, in the uh, form of a, uh, an infinitive to communicate. Then there's uh, koinoneo, which is used eight times to be, ta uh, be taker, uh, five times, that is, in the sense of to be a partaker of something. Uh, communicate twice and distribute once. That's in the King James Version. <coughs> the word doctrine, uh, there are two words, didache, uh, which uh, refers to the authority of teaching, and didaskalia deals with the act of teaching. 
Now, what's significant about these two terms is this. The word koinonia simply means, when you take all uh, the uses together, simply means communion or joint participation with the nature of that to be determined by the context. For instance, it's used of the Lord's Supper in 1 Corinthians 10, 16. It's used of the contribution in Acts 2, verse 42. It's used of the ministering to the saints uh, in the form of a contribution, 2 Corinthians 8, verse 4. It's used of the relationship that Christians sustain to God and to Christ, 1 John 1, verses 3 and 4, and also of the relationship of Christians to one another in 1 John chapter 1, verse 7. Fellowship involves, by definition, when you consider, again, all of the uh, aspects of its use in a religious sense, religious context, a state or condition of communion with God, and the actions or activities that are consistent within that state. But the guy in Woods has properly defined fellowship then as partnership, joint sharing, adding, quote, through the acceptance of the word of life, a unity of faith, practice, and worship is established. And it was for this purpose that the life was being declared. He's commenting on 1 John 1, verse 3. Here, in that passage, in the most emphatic fashion, the writer points out that only in the unity of faith is there communion in religion. It is possible to have fellowship. Now watch. It is possible to have fellowship only when there is a common bond established in faith, work, and love. Amen. Now, that's page 213 of his commentary on 1 John. Such a definition and exposition is consistent with the evidence of the lexicons, and by definition, certain things are thus demanded of the New Testament doctrine of fellowship. Now, concerning the matter of doctrine, uh, whether we're using the word didache, referring to the authority behind the doctrine, or the authority uh, concerning what's being taught, or we're using the word didascalia, referring to the actual act of the teaching, uh, again, it is tied to <coughs> and involved in the relationship that the Christian holds to God. And it has a bearing on the subject of fellowship. You cannot separate the two. That brings us to a consideration of the divine book that governs fellowship, the book of fellowship, which, of course, in the New uh, in the gospel age is the New Testament of Jesus Christ, the Word of God. And it governs the realm of fellowship. It is God's law, God's rule of action. We have a lot of folks running around teaching this nonsense that we're not under law. That's foolish. How do they know that? Is, that, is there a law that there is no law? Is that a law they've concocted? You cannot speak. Uh, what, what's amazing about these fellows, when they take these positions, the very language they use to describe their position implies the opposite of what they're trying to teach. You cannot say, it's just like saying, I know you cannot know anything. Saying there is no law, well, is that a law? Is it a law there's no law? They cannot deal with it. The fact of the matter is, the New Testament is the law of Jesus Christ. In Galatians 6, verse 2, Paul says, Bear ye one another's burdens, and so fulfill what? The love letter. The love letter. No. The law of Christ. Look at uh, Romans 8, verse 2. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. What law? It's not the law of Moses that's under consideration there. But it's the law of the Spirit, the law of the Spirit gave. Which Spirit? The Holy Spirit. James 1, verse 25, we're to look in the perfect law of liberty. Now what law is that? James 2, verse 8, we're to fulfill the royal law. James 2, verse 13, we have the perfect law of liberty, or the law of liberty there. And so again, over and over, the New Testament teaches that we are under law. In uh, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5, Paul is dealing with the servant, particularly the soldier, and uh, the one who is striving for the mastery, and then he says that he must strive lawfully in order to be crowned. Now, how can you strive lawfully if there's no law to strive by? 
You have to have a law there to, in order to be lawful. The New Testament is that standard. Listen to what the Son of God himself said. John 12, verse 48. He that rejecteth me and receiveth not my word hath one that judgeth him. The word that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day. Colossians 3, verse 17. Whatsoever ye do in word or in deed do all in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, giving thanks unto God and the Father by him. My friends, Jesus Christ's word is the law. Well, what's his word? It's the New Testament. Nothing short of that. Matthew 28, verse 18, he says, All authority is given unto me in heaven and on earth. Go ye therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them into the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you all the way, even unto the end of the world. Matthew 28, 18 through 20. As a result, we must respect New Testament authority, and that includes the New Testament teaching in the area of fellowship. Philippians 3, verse 16. These are passages we're familiar with. Nevertheless, whereto we have already attained, let us walk by the same rule. Let us mind the same thing. Philippians 4, 2. You know what's significant about Philippians 4, 2? What is striking to me about it? Paul doesn't tell us what the problem was between these two sisters. But he does tell us what the answer to their problem was. And really, it's the answer to every problem, isn't it? When you get down to it. He says, I beseech you, odious, and beseech Syntyche, that they be of the same mind in the Lord. Well, what does that in the Lord mean? It means in keeping with the Lord's will. And so if you're of the same mind with everyone else in keeping with the Lord's will, what are you going to have? Unity. That's exactly what you'll have. You'll be in fellowship with one another. And these sisters, what, you know, he doesn't really tell us who was, a, who was at fault here. I was in a Bible class one time, and uh, one dear little old sister was reading this passage, and she referred to uh, Sister Odious and Sister Stinky. <laughs> well, whether it was Sister Odious or Sister Stinky that was at fault, Paul really doesn't tell us, but he does tell us what they needed to do to solve the problem. 1 Corinthians 1, verse 10. Now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. What does that mean? By the name of. Open up in the name of the law. We know what that means. By the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, by his authority. The Lord's commanded it. This is not, a, this is not an option. It's obligatory. That ye all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you, but that ye be perfectly, completely joined together in the same mind, and in the same judgment. <coughs> so there's a, there is the need to respect that wonderful book that we sang about just a moment ago, the book divine, the word of God, and especially that word as it is revealed in the New Testament of Jesus Christ, sanctified by the precious blood of Christ, Matthew 26, verse 28. Well, that brings us to the demands of fellowship. I don't know how my time's running. Don't have my timer. But we want to look at these as uh, time permits. There are three basic principles set forth in the Bible relative to fellowship that affect the subject of unity that we must know and understand. First, there must be and there is the principle of agreement that involves obedience. Can two walk together except they be agreed? Amos 3, verse 3. The prophet Amos was the spokesman of God. He was the Nevi of Jehovah. And he was prophesying and preaching what God had sent him to prophesy and preach. And he was walking with God, but the people were walking contrary to the message that Amos had brought. And so Amos was chiding them and pointing out, you're not walking with me. And so as a result, you're not walking with God. And uh, you're fooling yourself if you think God's going to help you. God's on your side. You're headed for trouble. Punishment's just around the corner. Man must first be in agreement with deity in order for a condition or situation involving proper fellowship can exist and true unity exists. When one receives and obeys the doctrine of Jesus Christ, he is in fellowship with both the Father and the Son. Listen to John, 10, uh, John 14, verse 23. Jesus said, If a man love me, he will keep my words. And literally the Greek says he'll keep on keeping. He'll make a practice of keeping his words. 
and my Father will love him, and we will come unto him and make our abode with him. Do you want God abiding with you? You've got to abide with God. You've got to do his will, carry out his, his word, obey what he has to say. In Ephesians 3, verse 17, Paul says that uh, Christ dwells in our hearts by what? By the faith, the gospel of Christ. Now, how does that happen, folks? By accident? By accident? No, one has to be obedient to the gospel. For faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God, Romans 10, 17. The gospel itself is the power of God unto salvation. Romans 1, verse 16. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed, that is, the means by which God makes or declares man righteous, from faith unto faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. It's on the principle of faith. And it is based upon one's obedience to that word, which is the faith. In 2 John 9 through 11, Whosoever transgresseth and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ hath not God. He that abideth in the doctrine of Christ hath both the Father and the Son. If there come any unto you that bring not this doctrine, receive him not into your house, neither bid him God's feet. For he that biddeth in God's feet is what? He is partaker of his evil deeds. He becomes culpable of the crime the individual's committed. He's guilty. And so from these passages we see the necessity of uh, being individuals who obey the truth and understand the importance of obeying the truth in order to be in fellowship with God. That's a principle that goes back uh, to the Old Testament. Ecclesiastes 12, verse 13 summarized it. Let us hear the conclusion of the matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole of man. This is what the sum and substance of man's existence in this life is about. That's the principle. In Isaiah 8, verse 20, Isaiah chided the people of his day to the laws of the testimony. If they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. He called upon them to obey the word of God, to speak according to it, to act in keeping with it. And that same thing, principles brought over in the New Testament. Acts chapter 10, verses 34 and 35. Paul, uh, the Apostle Peter says, Of a truth I perceive that God is no respecter of persons, but in every nation he that feareth him and worketh righteousness is accepted with God. Watch it. Fears him, works righteousness. You must have the right attitude. You must have the right actions. You've got to obey from the heart what God has said in order to have proper fellowship with God. Then, Revelation chapter 22, verse 14. Here's the ultimate in the fellowship with Jehovah, is it not? You look at Revelation 22, verse 14. Do you want to know who's going to go to heaven? Just look at what that passage says. Blessed are they that do his commandments, that they may have right to the tree of life and may enter in through the gate into the city. You want to go to heaven, you're going to have to do the word of God. You're going to have to do his commandments. Brother Dan, you mean you believe in commandment keeping? Absolutely. Right. Absolutely. Oh, that makes you a legalist. If that's how you want to define it, guilty. Guilty is charged. And that also makes John a legalist because that's what he wrote. And that makes the Lord a legalist because that's what he taught in Matthew 7, 21. Now, you want to throw those words around? I can throw a few words too. Libertarian. Libertine. Liberal. How about those terms? I'd much rather be a legalist that goes according to the word of God and find heaven as my home than to be a liberal and wind up in a devil's hell burning for hopping from brick to brick for all eternity. And that's exactly what these folks are going to be doing. First Peter chapter four, verse eleven. Peter says, If any man speak, let him do what? Speak as the oracles of God. Speak as the oracles of God. We could go through a number of other passages that demonstrate this principle of uh, agreement, Hebrews 5, 8, 9, and so on, but time is pressing. There's the principle of inclusion. And again, this is not original with me. This is stuff that I heard sitting at the feet of Thomas B. Warren some 30 years ago. 
This is stuff that I heard from Brother Roy Deaver, Brother Bill Klein, Franklin Camp, and up these other great men that we've had the opportunity to hear through the years. And, but you're not hearing these type of lessons anymore, brethren. You're not hearing this taught at Memphis. You're not hearing it taught at East Tennessee School of Preaching. You're not hearing it taught at Tri-Cities. Why? What has happened? Why isn't it taught at Southwest? They don't believe in the principle of inclusion and the principle of exclusion. That's what it comes down to. They don't believe what the Bible teaches anymore on fellowship. They have opened the floodgates and they do not know how to close them. They cannot and still continue to get the support and funds they're getting from the people they're getting. Brethren, we are, we are dealing with folks today, this situation this afternoon, concerning gestalt therapy and some of the remarks that were made. Brethren, we've got folks that don't know the difference from gestalt therapy and gesundheit. <laughs> and yet they want to come and lecture us or lecture those who have studied this nonsense who understand the dangers and damage that it does, who have read the material, who understand the material, who have fought the material, they want to come and lecture and tell us we don't know what we're, we're talking about. Well, let me just say this. If an individual opens up an institute, he says it's the Calvinist Institute of Education. What is the general assumption you're going to make concerning what he believes and teaches? Regardless of what he says about it, if he calls himself a Calvinist, you can pretty much put it down. There are at least five points he holds to in some fashion. <laughs> there may be a few other variations here and there because I found some of these guys who are claiming to be Calvinists don't even understand what Calvin taught. But if they do that, you know what? You know what? That. And if an individual says he is teaching and promoting gestalt therapy, my friends, he is a gestaltist. And it is an immoral doctrine. And it is by its very nature humanistic. An individual can say, I don't believe in secular humanism. But if you believe in, in the principles of Gestalt therapy, you are a secular humanist. Pure and simple. And if someone wants to stand up and defend that foolishness, they're going to go to hell right along with it. The Bible teaches that those that uh, justify the wicked and condemn the righteous are equally an abomination with the, before the Lord. You cannot defend error, uphold unrighteousness and ungodliness, and not suffer the consequences. Well, what is the principle of inclusion? It's simply this. When two or more persons obey the law of Jesus Christ, and are thus brought into fellowship with God, they are quite naturally then brought into fellowship with one another. Ephesians 2 illustrates this principle, where Paul uses the illustration of the Jew and Gentile being reconciled to God and by God in one body, by the cross, so making one new man. The enmity, that is the law of commandments contained in ordinances, being slain by the death of Christ, the law of Moses itself being put to death there, uh, thereat, uh, thus abolish this enmity between Jew and Gentile, so making peace by him who is our peace, verses 11 through 17. This is predicated on our being saved by grace through the faith, and that not of ourselves, it is the gift of God, that is, the salvation is God's gift. Uh, Ephesians uh, 2, 8 through 10. They received and obeyed the message of peace, and as a result they entered into the condition of being reconciled not only to God, but the one another, verse 17. Thus, in uh, Ephesians chapter 3, Paul writes about the mystery uh, of uh, how God would take uh, two men, Jew and Gentile, and make them one in Christ. Uh, Ephesians uh, 3, verse 6. Then look at 1 John chapter 1. It illustrates the same principle. It sets forth this basic principle of inclusion and fellowship. In 1 John chapter 1, verse 3, John says that he and the other apostles declare Christ to them that ye also may have fellowship with us. Paul, John said we're in fellowship 
you can have fellowship with us. And he said, verily, our fellowship is with the Father and with the Son, Jesus Christ. So if you have fellowship with the apostles, you have fellowship with Christ and with God the Father. And now look at verse 7. If we walk in the light, keep on walking in the light, we have fellowship one with another. If we walk in the light, that's a conditional statement, third class conditional. If we walk in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanses us from all sin. Condition, we've got to walk in the light. The light of God's Word, Psalm 119, verse 105. The Word is that which gives life, Psalm 119, verse 130. We walk in that light, the light of truth, then we have fellowship with one another. And we also have the continual benefit of the cleansing blood of Christ. But it is conditioned on our continuing to walk in the light. And part of that involves, when we do sin, confessing that sin, verse 9, and receiving forgiveness thereby. As men walk together with God, they necessarily walk together with one another. Ideally, then, our fellowship ought to include all of those with whom God is in fellowship. Now, we have seen that there are some, God says, we should not fellowship, 2 John 9 through 11. Ephesians 5, 11 says, Have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. By the way, we've got some folks who have come up with this idea concerning fellowship that there are statutes of limitations on fellowship issues. And so if it's been something happened 15 years ago, somehow God's miraculously taken care of that, or mysteriously, without the blood of Jesus, just washed it away. So that we, we can't withdraw from that party today. Well, let's see, Ephesians 5.11, And have no fellowship unless it's been 15 years ago with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reproof. That's how that passage ought to read, to fit Brother Dave Miller. Brethren, that's just foolish. In fact, it's not only foolish, it's absolutely stupid to make that position, take that position. Brother Wayne Coates has a saying I like, and I've found myself using it more and more the last few years. Isn't it a pity that stupidity is not painful? <laughs> We have an awful lot of hurting people. We must be careful not to sever fellowship with those with whom God holds fellowship, to rend the body of Christ with a sort of division through a stubborn insistence on a pet hobby or opinion that is a matter of indifference is sinful. And we need to avoid that. But then there's the principle of exclusion, and this is where we're having most of our problems. This is anticipated by the principle of inclusion. This limits the scope of fellowship. If fellowship with others is predicated upon their and our obedience to the doctrine of Jesus Christ, then it follows that fellowship cannot be extended to nor maintained with those who abide not in that doctrine. That's what 2 John 9 says. If certain ones and only certain ones are said to be in my fellowship, then it follows that there are those excluded from that fellowship. What is so difficult to get grasp in that? We've looked at Ephesians 5.11. What about 1 Timothy 5.22? Be not partakers of other men's sins. Keep thyself pure. That text implies it is possible to become a partaker of another man's sin. And that's exactly what is taking place in this fellowship nonsense. These brethren that are going and appearing with, Doc, with Dave Miller and uh, others like him, it's not a case of they, they're becoming brothers B, C, D, E, F, G, J, right on down to Z. They have become brother A by virtue of the fact that they have become culpable in the sin of Brother Miller, who is the original A in the thing. And when they become culpable, then it becomes a sin to fellowship them. That's not hard to grasp. You have to help, help the missing. Romans 16, 17. Now I beseech you, brethren, mark them who cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which ye have learned, and avoid them. Contrary to what? Contrary to the doctrine. 1 Timothy 4, verse 16. 
Now take heed unto thyself and unto the what? The doctrine. Continue in them, for, do it, for in doing this thou shalt do what? Both save thyself and them that hear thee. Doctrine's important? Absolutely. Absolutely. You can't get away from it. The, te the teaching of the New Testament. That's what the doctrine is. You cannot. You know, some years ago, when I was a much younger preacher, I tried out of the congregation and sat in a men's business meeting where one of the men, they didn't have elders, made this statement. He says, what's all this hullabaloo over doctrine? He says, I'm tired of hearing sermons about doctrine. I said, brother, what would you have us preach? He said, preach on the love of Jesus. I said, can't do that. He said, why? I said, you've ruled it out. He said, no, I, I did, how did I do that? I said, the love of God, the love of Jesus is part of the doctrine of Christ. You just threw it out. In fact, brethren, look at Matthew chapter 7. You can't preach anything concerning the Sermon on the Mount if you can't preach doctrine. If doctrine's not binding on us, everything on the Sermon on the Mount's got to be thrown out, including Matthew seven twelve. How about that? In Matthew 7, verse 28 and 29, the Bible says that when Jesus had finished, had come to the end of these sayings, had finished these sayings, the people were astonished at his doctrine. At his doctrine. And literally the Greek is saying, at his manner of teaching. He's talking about the teaching that he had done or the way in which he had taught. And then it says in the very next verse, because he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. His doctrine. He, had, he was one in whom authority dwelt. And so he turned beet red when I told him we can't even preach on the love of God because he had just thrown that out. Now, brethren, the doctrine of Christ covers everything in the New Testament from Matthew chapter 1 all the way to Revelation 22. We either believe it, teach it, or uphold it, or let's turn out the lights, take down the sign, go home, and go fishing. Because anything less is going to send us to hell anyway. Thank you. Lay me into that, and that's no.